Hello, hello. Welcome to KDR TV, Diaspora Dive. Today we are very much privileged again to have a Kenyan lawyer and international barrister, Dr. Miguna Miguna, who resides in Canada. Dr. Miguna Miguna has been a Kenyan politician, a tactician in the former Prime Minister's office. He did a wonderful job in ensuring that the 2010 Constitution came into effect by marshalling the officials at the Prime Minister's office in Nairobi. During his tenure, Dr. Miguna Miguna did a lot of work as a Kenyan, a patriotic Kenyan, to ensure things move in the right direction. Whatever happened in the middle of his tenure at the Prime Minister's office is still a tale to be told. And Dr. Miguna Miguna today is live on KDR TV to tell Kenyans what he feels about his beloved country. Now, before we bring Dr. Miguna Miguna, most Kenyans are asking what is actually happening on KDR TV. KDR TV is becoming the diaspora voice for Kenyans living outside the country. They can come, give their views. They can come, tell us more stories about what they think their country, Kenya, should be. And today, as we bring uh, Dr. Miguna Miguna on stage, be focused. Try to subscribe. Try to like our page. Write a comment. Ask a very hard question. And you know Dr. Miguna Miguna is not afraid of any question coming his way. So he's here. And welcome Dr. Miguna Miguna from Toronto, Canada. Dr. Miguna Miguna, welcome to KDR TV. Uh, thank you very much. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Thank you very much. So, um, how are you and your family protecting yourself from getting infected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, um, we are, uh, as usual, staying safe. Um, we don't uh, go and mingle uh, with others uh, in public. Uh, we are keeping our distance, as recommended by the health authorities. Uh, we wear masks in public. And, uh, we sanitize. So that's the way that uh, we are keeping ourselves safe. So far, so good. Thank you very much. So is your local government protecting its citizens from getting infected with uh, coronavirus? And if so, give a brief description on their preparedness and how they are handling uh, the people who are infected? Well, Kibwatu, you know that uh, the Canadian government and Canadian society in general is way ahead of the, uh, the global mechanisms of uh, controlling this pandemic. The rates of infection in Canada from coast to coast are much, much lower than, say, for example, in the United States, which just borders largest border that the United States has with any other country is actually Canada. Yet, whereas close to 500,000 people have died of COVID-19 in the U.S., um, I think much, much, much lower numbers are in Canada. I don't even think we are at 20,000. 20, so that tells you that there is something uh, that is happening in Canada you know, positively, that is not happening in the United States, for example. And one of them is that in Canada, like many other countries, there is universal health care. Everyone has a right to have medical care. Uh, medical care is a public uh, service, like any other, and it is completely free. Anybody can go to hospital, any hospital, and see 
any doctor and can get medical care without paying anything. Because healthcare is considered an essential service and is funded 100% by taxpayers' money. So there is no private medical care. Because of that, uh, we find that I think when somebody uh, has illness or is not feeling well, they can easily have medical attention and therefore limit to other you know, health exposures. But I think COVID-19 seems to kill people with uh, other pre-existing conditions. And if you have access to Medicare, I think that th those pre-existing conditions are limited to a very large extent. Uh, Canada is also a, wealth, a welfare state, so which means that those who have no employment or who are economically challenged get support from the public authorities. So the rates of absolute uh, poverty is somehow limited compared, say, uh, with the United States. And then when there is a lockdown, it's effective and it is um, complied with. Not because of brute force. I've not seen any police officer stopping anybody. I've not seen any police officer abusing anybody. I've not seen or heard that somebody has died because of an encounter between people who have not observed the lockdown or restrictions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their daily activities, as you see in Kenya. But yet, people actually do comply, which means that uh, laws have to be enforced humanely. Um, and if you do it humanely, and the people have the feeling that you care for them, they will actually obey the laws. But when you try to impose laws on people and impose restrictions without regard to everyone's you know, different needs and conditions, then the people tend to resist and disobey the laws. And that has a negative impact on the health of the country. So, I am glad that the Canadian society and their governments, the Ontario government, for example, and the Canadian federal government, have done much more than other countries have done. And uh, as a result, many of us are safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Miguna. Uh, on a comparative analysis, before we actually go dig deeper and blame our, our government, at least, I want you uh, specifically to tell the Kenya, I mean, to give us a brief description on how uh, your relatives are giving you stories about how the Kenyan government or the county governments, wherever they are living, is actually trying to protect uh, them against the pandemic. So uh, you have a family in Kenya. Which, uh, which stories are they telling you about the government's efforts to fight the pandemic? Brother Mweri, um, this is not a question of blaming the government. I think many people, many Kenyans, are agreed. This is common ground. Kenyans are agreed that uh, the regime in Nairobi has failed. When a government uh, wastes billions of shillings uh, through the shady procurement, um, I would say criminal activities, because what we have read about the loss of uh, donations of masks and the, uh, the personal protective equipment and the lack of medication in hospitals and the fact that nurses and doctors have not been paid for probably months to years and nurses are still on strike. When you see that, and you see the amount of money being wasted in political activities and diversionary exercises, such as the, uh, the BBI, for example. Uh, it is a sorry state. What I am hearing, what I have seen, are lots of Kenyans dying because they do not have access to health care. 
I have people in my village who have died because of that lack of access to healthcare. I know people from my village who have died in Nairobi uh, from COVID-19 uh, because they were not even able to see a doctor. They were not able to access um, adequate, proper medical care. And we have a lot of billions, hundreds of billions of shillings being wasted and being stolen by those with access to healthcare abroad. Our politicians, all of them, can go abroad and get proper healthcare. All the politicians can go to Nairobi Hospital and get healthcare. But the majority of citizens of Kenya, nearly 90% plus, cannot do that. So it's not a question of blame. It's a question of complete, total failure and abdication of responsibility on the part of the public authorities in Kenya. People pay taxes. Kenyans pay more taxes than the average citizen all over the world. But whereas in Canada here, we get free Medicare the people in Kenya don't get that. In fact, the other day, I read that even the NHIF card will not cover you if you have COVID-19. So what does that tell the citizen? It tells the citizen that they are on their own. And with a pandemic, that means uh, that the government is happy to see its citizens die. Lastly, I don't want to take too long on this one, the police have killed more than 2,000 people since the COVID-19 pandemic came in March this year. That's the same number that died in post-election violence in 2007, 2008. That's massive. 2,000 people killed, murdered on the streets simply because they were found on the streets after the so-called uh, curfew. These are people who had not committed any crime. And even if they had committed crimes, they should not have been subjected to brutality and death. But that's what you have. Um, you know, uh, it's really pathetic when we hear about uh, really citizens who have paid, uh, who, are, who have contributed uh, through NHIF, and when they go to the hospital, they are left actually again to, to, to fend for them, so sell their cows or chicken to ensure that they get treated. You know, it's pathetic. But in one, or, or in one way or the other, do you think or do you believe that the government is actually doing a, any effort to ensure its citizens are, are safe? Let's take, for example, uh, the KEMSA uh, scandal. Up to now, we've not actually had any any uh, proper um, uh, investigations done to ensure that uh, the culprits are actually brought to book. So uh, if, do you think that the government in any way is trying its level best to ensure things are actually good for its citizens or it's just um, uh, 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 it's playing games with its citizens? Uh, the government is complicit in uh, the crime against Kenyans. The Ministry of Health uh, received donations from World Health Organization, received donations from MA, uh, received uh, donations from many, many, many other uh, countries. And instead of using the donations to take care of its citizens, they sold uh, what had been donated uh, to Kenyans at inflated prices. And some of the things that were donated were exported to other countries. And this was being done uh, by public officers, government officials, uh, from the minister going down, from actually the president going down, because the president's daughter and other relatives are involved in COVID-19 um, so-called KEMSA billionaire scandal. Um, David Murade's company uh, is one of the beneficiaries of this scandal. 
Mr. Ngatia, who is a friend and business associate of the president, is involved in this scandal. And there are many, many others, like Junet Mohammed and his Wanga, and others who got money from this scandal. So it is both ODM and Jubilee are involved in this Kemsa scandal. Now, if you're going to steal donations, you're going to steal money from treasury that is allocated for uh, confronting the pandemic, then clearly you are part of the problem. And it is a deliberate uh, effort by these uh, cartels to ensure that Kenyans are sick, Kenyans are weak, Kenyans are desperate, Kenyans are despondent, because a despondent, weak, ill or sick population is easy to manipulate and control. So as far as I'm concerned, this looks like a political tool of control. But we have seen some efforts by the government. So I need you actually at least to give them some marks. Are you really giving them any marks or you're just giving them, I mean, out of 10, uh, how many marks are you giving the government? Negative a thousand. My goodness, that is, that is, that, that because is Because my friend, people. okay, so, so let me ask you. Yes. If you are having a global pandemic killing people in your country, and instead of using the resources, the limited resources you have to confront it by supporting healthcare workers, giving them PPEs, you are instead diverting 14 million plus to pursue a BBI, which is not an emergency, and which is not uh, something that Kenyans ask for. So why would I give you marks when you do that? Secondly, when you refuse to implement the Constitution, we passed the Constitution in, in 2010 by 65% of the Kenyan population. The Constitution is very heavy on accountability, transparency, public participation, and democratic practices. When you fail and refuse to implement that Constitution and does everything to subvert it, that is uh, inimical to the interest of the people. So why would I give you credit? Why would I say you are doing something good when you are not doing something good? When you undermine the judiciary, which is the third arm of government and the only arm of government that can uh, deliberate on disputes between the citizens and their governors. And the judiciary issues uh, court orders against egregious abuses and subversions by the government or its officials. And the government officials refuse to obey those court orders and say court orders mean nothing. It's not worth the piece of paper they are printed on. Why would we give you credit when you have demonstrated that you are completely ungoverned, ungoverned and ungovernable? So there is no credit I can give the so-called government of Kenya. This is an illegitimate government. This is an unaccountable government. This is a tyrannical government. This is a government that does not uh, comply with the tenets of democracy and the rule of law. To be very fair, Sometimes it's good actually to give marks where it's due or credit, give credit where it's due. It's okay. I mean, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are trying actually, I mean, you have, you have, you have, you have discredited the government in whichever direction they have actually tried to fight the con uh, pandemic. But at least we've seen them do something. But that is, I mean, let's just let that one pass. I know, no, I know no, you want, I, I know, I, I know I you want, want to... yes. No, no, Go ahead. Yes. I don't want to let that one pass. Because I would like you to give me an example of what the government has done right. So we agree that the government stole donations from WHO and Jack Ma. We agree. We also agree that the government 
has unleashed brutality on the people. And many people, I saw a report today from human rights defenders, between 1,700 to 2,000 people plus died as a result. We also know that the same same government announced that the Kemsa billionaire thieves would be arrested within 20 days. And that has not happened. We also know that the same same government has limited access of NHIF card holders who have paid. These are private uh, insured individuals who have paid over and above their tax shillings uh, that they cannot be treated if they have COVID-19. So show me evidence that the government has done anything positive for which we should give it credit. Actually trying to bring forth is about the doctor's strike. The doctors actually went on strike because they lacked the PPEs. They were, they were having uh, various um, 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 uh, issues they wanted actually the government to sort. And um, a few days ago, they came together and they said the government is actually going to ensure that their grievances are addressed. So do you, don't you think that is one, um, that is a max for the government or what, what, what's your take? My, my brother, show me what the government did. I mean, these doctors have not been paid. We all know how Dr. Mungus, Mungusu and, and what is his name? Um, the doctor that, uh, the young doctor that died in, in Nairobi. Yes. Uh, and many others. It's not just him. There are many, 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 many doctors in Kenya who have died of COVID-19. And there are many nurses who have died of COVID-19. And there are many Kenyans who are dying of COVID-19. Now, when you say the government has agreed to do something, but you're not able to mention what it is that they have agreed to do. So, so we are going to uh, give credit to a, a, a hypothetical myth that there is something to You see, the doctors may have agreed to go back to work, uh, probably because they are committed to addressing the needs of uh, Kenyans. I, I don't know if I'm frozen because I can't see myself speaking. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, your network, yeah, you have you have few network issues. Just go ahead, yep. Yeah, okay. So they may be committed because of the hypocritic oath that they took, that they want to actually prevent deaths. That's not a credit to the government. That's a credit to the doctors. There is nothing concrete that the government has done or given these doctors as a concession, have they been paid? No, they have not been paid. Have they all been given PPEs? No, they have not been given PPEs. Has an environment been created, a safe environment for their work? No, it has not happened. Have these doctors' conditions of employment been improved? None has been improved. So why are you giving them credit? Credit for what? That is, that, that is a question which can be answered by the government spokesperson or the minister himself. So we'll definitely no. be bringing that. No. that is a, no. We understand no. that one. We understand that no. one. No, yes. I disagree with you. If the government cannot answer for itself, the people have to answer. You know, you see, in a democracy, the people own the government. This is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's what a democracy is. And in a democracy, it is the people who must pass judgment over government. If a government fails to deliver services, it's the people who must say, we have determined this government has failed. The government spokesman praises the employer. It is the people, the employ, which is the ultimate employer of the government that have to say, that includes me. So when you see me here, for example, why am I speaking with you from Toronto and not from Nairobi? Because the government has disobeyed laws and disobeyed court orders and forced me out of Kenya. If I praise that government, there is something wrong with me. Because a government that has violated your rights, you cannot praise. 
Why would you want me to press somebody who has abused my rights, has violated them? You see, even beginning with that, then when you go to the issue of the health workers, then you have to ask yourself the question, why are nurses alike? Doctors can't work without nurses. And if the nurses are still on strike, and the government has not done anything to meet their demands, then this government stands condemned. That's my point. We'll delve, I mean, we'll delve deeper into that, um, in, into that conversation maybe later. Uh, today, let's, let's continue focusing on, uh, on a few key areas here uh, our viewers want to hear from you. Uh, let's, let's now um, continue with the, with, with the conversation. So as an African immigrant living in Canada, we understand why you're actually living in Canada. You, you're supposed to be living in, I mean, you're supposed to be uh, working and staying in Kenya as a, a Kenyan patriotic, but because of, uh, uh, of the government, you are actually in exile. That one, Kenyans actually understand, and there's no Kenyan uh, sane enough to say that it's fair the way the government treated you. That, that, that is completely uh, unfair. And especially from the diaspora's pers perspective, we believe that you're supposed to be in Kenya. That is your right. Okay, now let's go back um, and ask you another question here. As an, uh, an, as an African immigrant who is well-educated and well-informed about the way uh, research companies have been, have been associated with weird and orthodox methods in developing vaccines, uh, right now we've got two vaccines. We have one from, from Moderna and, the, and another one from Pfizer. Are you ready uh, to get, are you prepared or ready to get vaccinated? Kenyans would like to hear from you. Uh, first of all, I'm, an, I'm not an immigrant. An immigrant is somebody who buys an air ticket and goes to another country willingly and stays there, either because they are looking for a job, greener pastures, or whatever. Uh, I'm in exile. And I think it is important that if you work with the media, that you actually use appropriate terms to describe your, your guests. I am someone who was forced into exile, and I do not want you to refer to me as an immigrant because I did not come here, I did not immigrate to Canada. I was brought forcefully to Canada in violation of the laws. Secondly, Regarding the vaccines that have been put out by Moderna and Pfizer, I think it is great that Pfizer and Moderna, and these are scientists that came up with the vaccines. It's not the companies that did. These are individual scientists. Some of them are African. There is a Nigerian doctor, researcher, who is part of the Pfizer Go ahead. Are we on? Yeah, we are on. Go ahead. Go ahead. The doctor who is part of the Pfizer research team that came up with the vaccine. So the vaccine did not come out of nothing. It came out of work, brilliant work of uh, researchers, doctors, scientists that have uh, spent hours and hours and a lot of resources to come up with the vaccines. I cannot vouch for the vaccines because I do not know how safe they are. Uh, but, but I believe that uh, the world governments from Europe to North America to Asia would not willingly give poison to their citizens, will not willingly allow themselves to be injected with poison that will kill them. So I want to give uh, them the benefit of the doubt uh, that these vaccines probably have positive effects on those who take them. I would be willing to take a, a, the vaccine once I have observed uh, that it is safe. I'm not one of the people that will go in and uh, probably become guinea pigs. Uh, but once I've observed that the vaccines are safe, yes, I'm willing to, to take the vaccine. If the vaccine can prevent more deaths, then it would be responsible for me to say that the vaccines are bad. 
and that should not be taken by Africans. Because I don't want large numbers of Africans to die. Having said all of that, I also want to be clear that it is time Africans stopped complaining and whining about other people developing vaccines. Because we have brains like them. We have resources like them. If we don't like their vaccines, we should develop our own. That's a great one. Okay, now let's focus on politics. Uh, we've seen from the, uh, the messages online, uh, most people want to, and, I mean, to hear you talk about politics, and especially politics in Kenya. Okay, uh, we've read your tweets and willingness to vie for the gubernatorial uh, by-election in Nairobi County. Are you up to the task? And what makes you feel that you are the best candidate among the few other candidates who have declared interest? Uh, my brother, um, it is unfortunate the way the question is framed. I understand that. Uh, number one, number yes. one yes. if Sonko was a governor, and he was, then that question is an insult to me because Sonko is not fit to tie my shoe shoelaces. Sonko is not fit to become my driver. Um, not just on the basis that he's completely unqualified, but also on the basis that he's a cartel. He's, he's, he's one person, plus Kidero, plus Peter Kenneth, plus the rest of the people that they're lining up, who have made money uh, from engaging in criminal activity. I have practiced law for 25 years. I've practiced law where uh, lawyers are properly governed, where if you don't have integrity, you will be disbarred. So which means that you have to demonstrate competence, you have to demonstrate integrity, you have to demonstrate ability to protect public interests. And if you don't, you cannot practice law in any Canadian jurisdiction. I've done that for 25 years in unblemished. Number two, I've been involved in the fight for justice, social justice in Kenya since I was a teenager. In 1986, when I was at the University of Nairobi, I fought for democracy and multi-party you know, um, liberties and got into problems with the then dictatorship of Daniel Arap Moy because of my stand against dictatorship. I've maintained that stand throughout for years, for decades. That counts for something. I'm the only candidate, and by the way, I'm a candidate for the position of governor uh, of the county of Nairobi in this by-election. I was also a candidate and ran for the same position in 2017. Out of the whole lot, I'm the only one who had a manifesto, a, a transformative manifesto that had plans on water, on infrastructure, on garbage, dealing with the menace of garbage in Nairobi, dealing with the menace of unplanned development, bringing order and integrity in public you know, sphere. I had transformative plans of bringing subway system in Nairobi so that the citizens of Nairobi would not be reduced to wild animals traveling with vehicles on the streets. Very dangerous. It's very dangerous to live in Nairobi. Uh, Nairobi residents do not have a public transit system. A Matatu uh, system is not a public transit system. Uh, you know how uh, disorganized and dangerous the Matatu, uh, the whole menace of Matatu is in Nairobi. You know how bad uh, slums are in Nairobi. I had plans of eradicating slums in Nairobi. I had plans of job creation in Nairobi. And by the way, the moment you eliminate graft in public office, 
you have more than enough money to be able to do all of these things that I'm talking about. So you need a leader who, number one, has a vision. The vision has to be a vision for the transformation of the lives of the citizens. Number two, the leader has to be committed to transforming the socio-economic and political uh, welfare of the people. The people have to feel this is their government. It is a government that they elected and a government that only answers to them. Not to some godfathers in boardrooms or in parties. The people are the employer of the governor, not political parties, not Jubilee, not ODM, not their leaders. Number three, a leader has to be competent. A leader has to understand public policy. A leader has to be able to conceptualize public policy. A leader has to be able to implement public policy. Public policy for the benefit of the people. Number four, uh, I don't know if you're hearing me. Um, I'm hearing you very well. Are you hearing? Yes. Number four, a leader has to have practical, pragmatic, deliverables, plans that are capable of being implemented. And in my manifesto, I unveiled them. They were concrete, they were well thought out, and they were pragmatic. That's what a leader needs. And at the end of it, I've said this many times, the software of leadership is integrity, without which a leader is just a wild animal. You know, we are all but just wild animals if we don't have values, values of integrity, values of honesty, values of, of hard work, values of accountability, values of transparency, values of making sure that you know and you consider the public as your employers. Anybody else who thinks that they are leaders because they have money, that's not a leader. Because even drug dealers have money. Even the mafia has money. Organized criminals have money. That's not what you need. Leadership is not about money. And leadership is not about parties. Kenya has had parties since independence, but we are still living in conditions of stone age because we have not had leaders who consider the public as their employers. Uh, once again, viewers, this live stream is being brought to you by KDR TV. And if you have any questions, please uh, follow us on Facebook, subscribe, Follow us on uh, YouTube, and if you want your question answered, use hashtag KDRTV Live so that your questions can be populated to the system for them to be answered by Dr. Miguna. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miguna. Uh, let's now uh, really uh, focus again on the Nairobi gubernatorial position, I mean by election. You've stated very clearly uh, you, you, have, you had a, man, a manifesto which is still... Uh, or under your table or somewhere on the table right now because the by-election has, has actually been called. Critically, when you think about the Kenyan uh, 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 voter, they have specific ways of voting. Some of them are completely uninformed. And when they're actually going to vote, most of them uh, end up voting for people uh, you have actually described as demagogue, uh, illiterate, so what are you really going to do to ensure that Kenyans are going to vote for a leader who is credible, who is transparent, who is, who is educated, who is informed, so that they can make better decisions for, for, for the future? So what, what really needs to be done? Because you are a, a very transformative uh, leader, but most Kenyans actually vote the other way. So what do you think needs to be done in Kenya, Dr. Miguna? Uh, uh, 
I want to correct you, Omweri. Um, yes. You're a Kenyan, are you not? I am. Okay, so would you prefer a transformative leader or you'd prefer a cartel? I, I, a, a transformative leader? Yes, so most Kenyans are just like you. They also prefer transformative leader. But someone would like to convince you that between your home where you believe in transformative leadership and the ballot box, something happens to you when you are going to the polling station. And somehow there is an evil spirit that takes over your life, takes control over your hands, and makes you vote otherwise. That is false. We have not had democratic, transparent, accountable elections in Kenya since independence. That's the problem. The citizens have always voted for the right people. And I'll give you examples. When JM was first elected a member of parliament, Kanu banned him from running. And he was voted in without having campaigned. Those were Kenyans voting. When um, the elections of 1963 happened, and Kadu and other parties were supported by the colonialists. Kenyans voted for people who some of them were in jail and some of them did not have money in Kano. Those ones were Kenyans voting. They didn't vote for the cartels, they didn't vote for whatever. In 1969, when Ogingo Dinga disagreed with Jomo Kenyatta because Jomo Kenyatta had become a thief and a land grabber, in the mini election, Many Kenyans voted for KPU, and they did not vote for Kanu. But Kenyatta announced Kanu having won. That was not Kenyans voting. That was electoral fraud. When Kenyans voted in 2002, they voted against Kanu, which was in power, and Moi, for many years, and who were bribing them and beating people up and doing all manner of things. Those weren't Kenyans voting. Kenyans, and in 2007, and any other time Kenyans have voted, Kenyans have shown, including recently in Mswambweni, because I don't want Mswambweni to be seen as Ruto versus Railand Uru. No, it was Kenyans saying to those in power, you will not manipulate us, you will not control us, you will not decide for us. We know what we want. We want an open, transparent, democratic state governed by the rule of law. And we are not going to cow or koto to tyranny. We are not going to fear and succumb to uh, brute force or public money that you have looted and you want to use that to get more power. Similarly, in Nairobi, in 2017, Uhuru Kenyatta, William Ruto, and the rest of them stole elections, messed up the elections. There was no democratic election in Nairobi. Sonko did not win because there was no credible election. I'm not saying I won because I'm saying the election was not credible. But I'm saying if the elections were credible and Kenyans had elected somebody that they wanted in Nairobi, I would accept the results. And then if they made the wrong decision, they would be able to correct that decision in the next cycle of elections. People are allowed to make mistakes. That's human nature. If we don't make mistakes, we can't change. If we don't make mistakes, we can't transform society. So let's assume Kenyans made a mistake. It doesn't mean that they will make mistakes forever. It doesn't mean that they will never ever learn and do the right thing. I am saying, I am giving them that option. I am giving them the option to make the right decision. I am telling them, I, have a vision, I have serious concrete plans, I have values, I have integrity, 
I am qualified for the job. I am giving you that option. Now, if you decide that you want that, you vote for me. But I can't blame Kenyans for voting for cartels if they don't have the option. If you have Kidero and you have Sonko and you have Peter Kenneth and you have Wanjiru and you have Waweru, you have just a group of cartels. So Kenyans will choose one of them because they don't have an option of electing a clean person. That is why I am in the ballot. Much, Dr. Miguna. So let's a little bit now uh, focus on BBI. What's your take on BBI? BBI is a fraud. It is an orchestrated fraud by Ouru Kenyatta and Railo Dinga. Uh, the agenda for this orchestrated fraud is to to have a rerun for 2022 is to create factional fights between the oligarchy, between one oligarchy led by Uru Kenyatta and the other oligarchy led by William Ruto for purposes of controlling power in perpetuity for their selfish gains. I don't think Railo Dinga is a player in the BBI. He's a pretender, but he's not a player. Railodinga has no power, zero power in the government of Kenya. Railodinga has no control over Uru Kenyatta. Railodinga is just a con man who, who wants money and has realized that he can get more money if he supports Uru Kenyatta. But he has no values. He does not stand for him. BBI is one existential threat to the Kenyan state, Kenyan stability, the democratic system in Kenya, the rule of law, and the constitution. There is no reason why anyone would want to convince Kenyans that they need to change the constitution that has not been implemented. There is no reason why somebody would want Kenyans to believe that this constitution of Kenya 2010 caused post-election violence. It did not. This constitution of Kenya 2010 did not steal the elections of 2017. Uru Kenyatta did. This constitution of Kenya 2010 did not loot Kenya's resources. Uru Kenyatta and his group did. This constitution of, uh, of Kenya 2010 did not grab public land. Uru Kenyatta and his group did. This constitution of 2010 has not caused instability in Kenya. Uru Kenyatta and his group has done. So if you want to create stability, if you want to bring national cohesion, if you want to, end, uh, to bring peace, if you want to include all Kenyans, then you implement the constitution of Kenya 2010, you obey the laws, you subscribe to the rule of law, and everything else will work. So BBI is a fraud through and through. Those are your own words, and most Kenyans actually also, some of them uh, believe in what you are actually telling them. Me as a Kenyan, first of all, I also need, as, as, as a diasporan, I also need to see something actually which is uh, really uh, going to ensure that Kenya progress forward. Uh, from your own words, you have actually described the, the president, the prime minister. Those are your own words, actually. Those, those are not the, uh, the, 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 I mean, the beliefs or what, what we are actually propagating as KDR TV. But you are at liberty to say whatever you want actually to say. Uh, as a Kenyan, first of all, Dr. Miguna, I hope, I'm also at pains to ensure that our country actually moves forward. But one question uh, I want you to, uh, to, to tell Kenyans. You've, you've trust. I mean, you've trust. You've you've trashed or trashed the BBI. But one th one question is: Do you think that there is something, some good information that particular document or the whole document is just trash? First of all, Omweri, um, before you get to the document, 
ask yourself a simple question because I think it would be uh, disingenuous to start with a document. Start from the beginning. How did the idea come? In February, well, let's go to February uh, 2018. We were resisting uh, institutional electoral theft that Uhuru Kenyatta wanted to put in Kenya as the, uh, the default for elections. We were resisting all the companies and organizations and institutions and people that were part of that electoral fraud in 2018. All right? So there was economic boycott of companies that were part of that electoral fraud. We were also resisting police brutality. We were saying that the assassination of Chris Musando, Baby Pendo, and others were outrageous and that those who perpetrated those crimes should be brought to book. That's what we were saying. How did BBI solve those problems? It didn't. Msando is still dead. Those who killed Msando are the ones that are with Raila talking about BBI. We have not talked about Baby Pendo. We have not talked about the electoral fraud of 2017. We have not brought Uhuru and those who perpetrated that fraud to account. We have not done anything about uh, the other reports that Kenyans have worked and paid for, like the Waki report, the Krigler report, the TGRC report, the, Lungu, the Lungu Land report. If you are able to implement all these reports, plus the Auditor General's report, Uko, the former Auditor General, released more than seven very, very fundamental annual reports on the entire Kenyan state that if you were to implement, you would eradicate corruption in Kenya. If you did that, we will not be talking about BBI. BBI is nothing but just another report, but now a choreographed one, a report that has been concocted by hand-picked individuals who are not known, who had no authority from the, uh, from the population. Nobody came to me to ask me if I wanted a BBI. Nobody came to you, Omweri, and asked you if you wanted a BBI. Nobody went to Kenyans and asked them if they wanted a BBI. So why would we leave our constitution, the one we brought, after 20, 30 years of struggle, and give it up in exchange for some contrived, fraudulent document cooked up by hand-picked individuals appointed by Raila and Uhuru? Why would we do that? Uhuru wants to protect power he got illegitimately. But what is Raila protecting? Raila is the one whose election was stolen. Raila is the one whose supporters were killed. What has he done about his supporters? Has he gotten justice for his supporters? Who has been jailed that killed his supporters? How many of his supporters have gotten compensation? None. So why would we support this thing? This thing is not for us. This thing is for Uru Kenyatta, and Rai Lodinga is just a con man, pure and simple. Thank you, Dr. Miguna. Um, we have a question. I, I believe you can read that particular question uh, from uh, Adan Osman Mohammed. Dr. Miguna, do you think the same government that force, uh, forcefully uh, exile you will respect the will of Nairobi and in case you, we, you win the by-election and, and allow you back? Uh, well, that's not the point. Uh, number one, if it was up to the government, I will not be speaking with you. But I'm speaking with you. I don't do things because the government wants. I do things which are my right. So, right now, the government ought to obey court orders. 
the question he should be asking, and I have to say this, because people seem to uh, forget one thing, that disobedience of court orders is not a good thing. And if any government disobeys a court order, it is a duty of a citizen to say they must do it or else you get rid of them. You cannot be asking a person whose rights have been violated, uh, do you think the violator will allow you back? Essentially what you are trying to say is that I should give up and join the violator. And I won't. I will continue pushing the violator. So my answer is this. It's not up to the government. It's up to the Kenyan people. And if the Kenyan people elect me governor and insist that I must be back, I will be back. Nelson Mandela came out of jail after 27 years. Even Raila went to detention and came out after more than seven years. So this is the point. You don't give up what you are doing uh, because somebody has decided to disobey court orders, violate your rights and the constitution. You must continue to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question from Felix Maranga. Um, can you read that question, Dr. Miguna? Uh, that should the law allow for universal diaspora votes? Uh, what can be done? I don't know what that means, but I think what he's trying to ask is whether or not uh, the diaspora people should be able to vote. Yes. Kenyans in the diaspora have a right to vote in the Constitution. Essentially, the Constitution gives all citizens the right to vote. Now, the question is, why has the regime in Nairobi not facilitated that through their embassies and organs? Because you can even allow Kenyans in the diaspora to vote electronically. Electronic voting happens right now in a lot of places. Mail-in voting happens in the United States. There's no reason why Kenyans in the diaspora should not be able to submit their votes by mail, for example. Mechanisms can be created to ensure that those votes are secure and that they count and that they are not manipulated or somebody does not um, uh, announce the wrong result. Uh, but yes, all Kenyans in the diaspora should and must have the right to vote. Thank you very much. Dr. Miguna, there is another question there. You know, these are questions which are being populated from the, from the KDR TV uh, uh, Ash Live. And uh, Mr. Mohamed Deko Mohamed is asking, when are you coming back to Kenya? No, when will you want to come back? And okay. that person looks, he just woke up from amnesia. I did not remove myself from Kenya. I was forcefully brought here. I have made three attempts to go back to Kenya, and I have been blocked from getting to Kenya. So when you ask when will you want to come back, implies I don't want to come to Kenya, which makes a whole, you know, uh, which, which is a problem to me, because that person just woke up from a very long amnesia. Okay, another one there. Um, it, it's almost the same question like the, the first one. Um, we are ready e and eagerly waiting for him, okay? So... Um, you don't have to be in Kenya to campaign. You see, I've told them many times, the Dalai Lama is the president of Tibet outside Tibet. He's not in Tibet. Nelson Mandela was effectively elected president in jail because when he came out, there was just the transition. Kapondi may not be a very good example, but he was elected when he was in jail as the MP for Mount Elgon in 2007. Mark Mwetaga was elected MP for Nakuru Town in the 70s when in jail. JM Kariuki, as I said, was banned from running and was elected without having campaigned because he was stopped from campaigning. Mine is not very different. There are many other world leaders who have been elected to high public offices while they are in exile. The point is, I am 
by operation of law in Kenya. I am also in Kenya virtually. Kenyans can see me even right now. Kenyans read everything I post every day. If I am interviewed by Kenyan media, they can listen and see me, listen to me and see me virtually. Kenyans have to stop this um, pretense that you vote because you see someone physically. A lot of these people talking about when are you coming back to campaign have voted for Uru Kenyatta without having met Uru Kenyatta. They have voted for Raila Odinga without having met Raila Odinga. Some of them are supporting William Ruto right now and they don't know William Ruto. And they will never meet William Ruto. So they have to get off their high horses and learn that you support a cause because it is just, because it is the right thing to do, because it serves your interest to do so. It is in our best interest to have the best leaders that we can uh, get and to transform the country called Kenya for the benefit of everyone and posterity. And so it shouldn't matter where Miguna is. As long as Miguna can contest and you are able to vote for him, do so even if he's not allowed to come to Kenya to campaign physically. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Miguna. We have hundreds uh, of questions, but we'll definitely have to uh, answer a few. Uh, we, viewers, we, we promise that we'll be bringing Dr. Miguna back on live. Uh, definitely, we are planning if he'll be here every, every, every weekend to answer uh, your questions. But for the last question... But Umweri, now, I would, I would like to answer this question of Akelo Millicent. Doro. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Miguna. Because she says, Dr. Miguna, you call Raila Khan, yet you offer to support him by swearing him in. Is this not political hypocrisy? I will answer that directly. Number one, I did not support Rai Lodinga to betray Kenyans. I did not support Rai Lodinga to surrender to Uru Kenyatta and to become his puppet. I did not support Rai Lodinga so that he could try to vanish. He, should, he can try to hide under the carpet the atrocities Uru Kenyatta committed and his jubilee group. That's not what I supported. I did not support Raila Odinga to turn around and say Uru Kenyatta won elections that he did not win. I did not support Raila Odinga to become Uru Kenyatta's bag carrier, a pathetic bag carrier. This is what I supported. I supported the rule of law. I supported the constitution. I supported democracy. I supported credible elections. Essentially what I was doing is saying, Kenyans cannot be imposed on by someone who did not win elections. That whoever wins an election should be the one to assume power. In 2017, Raila Odinga won elections. I am very consistent. I have said that throughout. I did not say Uru Kenyatta won that election. I said it in 2017 even though I was not in ODM. I was an independent candidate for the gubernatorial election in Nairobi. I vied against Raila Odinga's candidate Evans Kidero, a thief. I was his opponent. I did not support Raila Odinga in 2017 election because I was an independent candidate. But he won the presidential election in Kenya. And once I realized he won, he won credibly. The majority of Kenyan voters voted for him. It would have been wrong for me to say I am not going to support a person who had won and I would I would support somebody who had even if that person was my candidate if my candidate loses an election I will not support them Uhuru 
Kenyatta did not win the 2017 election. Therefore, I opposed Uhuru Kenyatta's imposition of himself in power. What did Rail Odinga do? He betrayed me. I formed the National Resistance Movement to ensure that the rightful owner, the winner of the election, takes power. I was committed to it. Thank what you did very he much. do? Yep. He turned around, betrayed me to Uhuru Kenyatta. So he's the hypocrite, not me, because I've remained consistent and I will not change. Thank you, Dr. Miguna. We've so, we, have, we, we told you we have hundreds, uh, uh, we have hundreds of questions, actually. Uh, first of all, we would like our viewers to follow KDR TV so that Dr. Miguna can answer those questions. It doesn't mean that if he doesn't answer them today, he will not answer them next week or the week uh, thereafter. So the best option is just write your questions, uh, send them, uh, follow KDR TV live so that Dr. Miguna will get a chance to answer most of your questions. So, Dr. Miguna, uh, wow, it's a, 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 very, look, a very hard one. Look, from look at that silly question. <laughs> that uh, is it Tanga Tanga? What is Tanga Tanga? First of all, yeah. this person is like he just woke up from a very bad dream. Uh, what is Tanga Tanga? <laughs> how can somebody ask me that question if you have listened to me throughout? You understand? Like, I am saying I do not support Jubilee, I do not support this BBI nonsense, and I do not support ODM, I do not support anybody who subscribes to cartelism. I don't support thieves, I don't support looters, I don't support land grabbers, I don't support electoral uh, thieves, I don't support those who do not subscribe to the rule of law. That's it. Thank you very I, much, Dr. Migon. Go I ahead. am guided by the values I have already unveiled. And by the way, a lot of these people don't realize that when I was a student leader at the University of Nairobi, William Ruto was not at my level. Why? Do you understand? Like, yes, now he's the deputy president. But at that time, he was singing in, uh, in Christian Union, and I was a student leader. Uh, so so how, how do I, you know what I mean? Like William Ruto ideologically is not at my level. Philosophically is not at my level. He may have more money than me because he has stolen the money. Just like Uru has stolen, just like Raila has stolen, just like the whole lot of them have stolen. I don't care about the money they have stolen. I care about values. So for somebody to bring the nonsense about Tanga Tanga, is just to show you that some of these Kenyans need to liberate their heads, liberate their minds. Thank you much, Dr. Miguna. Uh, this, Felix Maranga is uh, saying that Miguna's victory will open a great avenue for diaspora candidate for the public office. Okay, uh, Dr. Miguna, as we are closing up the, uh, the interview, the conversation, uh, we would like you to tell Kenyans, if you'll be willing and ready uh, to work with President Uhuru Kenyatta, if you win, or if you become the governor of Nairobi? Uh, Omweri, the governor of Nairobi does not work for Uhuru Kenyatta. The, government, the governor of Nairobi works for the people of Nairobi, the residents of Nairobi. Not just the citizens, the residents, all the residents of Nairobi that pay taxes, that live in Nairobi. That would be my main focus. There is nothing I have to do with Uru Kenyatta. Okay, let me let me let me, let me reframe my question, Dr. Yeah. Migona. Are you ready to work with State House and mend fences with the Kenyan government if you become the governor of Nairobi? Mend fences? Mend what fences? Uh, they offer an olive branch to, 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 for reconciliation with the president and, uh, and, and, uh, and his government. That, that, that's the question. I think that's a silly question. The president disobeyed court orders. The president disobeyed, uh, subverted the constitution. The president um, violated my rights. So it's not up to me to give the president an olive branch. The president must first of all bring himself within compliance with the law. 
So if the president say, for example, uh, and by the way, I don't want to call it the president. I think it's the Jubilee president. If the Jubilee president says, I'm going to obey all the laws, I'm going to comply with the provisions of the constitution, I'm going to respect your human rights and the human rights of all Kenyans, then yes, because at that time, he would have reformed. It's up to Uhuru Kenyatta to reform, not up to me, to say that I am giving him an olive branch. I can't give a criminal an olive branch, an unreformed criminal. So number one, he has to reform. He has to bring himself to uh, accountability. Uh, and if he does, and, and the, 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 the requirements of the law are met, then I will deal with him like I deal with any other citizen, the same way I deal with you. Gona, um, what do you need, or what do you, uh, what do you believe if, I mean, do you believe that the diaspora narrative, which is actually being uh, fronted by One Voice uh, Consortium, is going to bring all Kenyans together? Or uh, which advice do you give the people of diaspora, especially who wants to vie in any political position in Kenya? As you, uh, after you answer that question, please uh, have, a, have your closing remark as you are speaking to Kenyans directly. Thank you. Yes, Omweri, thank you very much. Number one, um, thousands and thousands of people cannot speak with one voice. Okay? So that would be undemocratic. Uh, they can't speak with one voice. They may speak with one voice on certain issues that affect them. So, for example, the issue of uh, being able to exercise their right to vote, that they can speak on because it affects all of them and it is a positive right. The issue of having them run for office and occupy public office in Kenya, that's an issue that is positive and affects all of them, those they can speak with in one voice. But as to political orientation, shades of opinion, those ones you have to allow, because if you don't allow that, you would be trying to create a monolithic opinion, which is just as bad as tyranny. So I don't subscribe to monolithism. I don't subscribe to the issue that everybody must agree. But we can agree on broad issues that affect all of us. So yes. On broad issues, the diaspora, Kenyan diaspora, should be able to speak with one voice. On the idiosyncratic issues of opinion, shades of opinion, and our religious and other beliefs, those ones you have to accommodate because that's how human life is. Number two, um, I think this is a great opportunity for the diaspora to demonstrate to those in Nairobi wielding power that their economic strength, because the dias Kenyan diaspora remits more money than Kenya gets from coffee and tea and tourism combined. They should be able to demonstrate to Nairobi that their economic power matters, that their voice matter, and that their rights matter and they have to do that by supporting candidates that would add value to their lives they have to do that by initiating and prosecuting cases that will result into orders and judgments that would support their interests and they have to do that by speaking up consistently against injustice, against discrimination, against marginalization, against corruption, against tyranny. That the Kenyan diaspora have no option but to do. I can't hear you. Hmm. Can you hear me right now, Dr. Miguna? I can hear you right now. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Miguna, for having time to speak to KDR TV live.
we are going to have you most of the days. We are actually inviting all Kenyans to come so for a candid conversation. We want to improve our country. So Dr. Miguna is a Kenyan. Uh, Dr. Miguna is a patriotic Kenyan. We want to hear him. We want to support him in every uh, endeavors because he's also a patriotic Kenyan. So anybody who is a Kenyan and wants to run for a political office in Kenya, we welcome you. Even if you are from the government, wherever you are staying, wherever you are living, uh, if you are, especially people or, or who are living out, out, outside of Kenya, that is the diaspora uh, nation, please come forward. Let's have a conversation. Let's improve Kenya. So, Dr. Miguna, what do you tell the people of Nairobi who are willing to vote for you? That is your final closing remarks as we are waiting for another uh, session uh, from, uh, from KDR TV. We are actually going to have a, a session for mental health where we are bringing some experts to speak about mental health and domestic abuse. Do Dr. Miguna, the Nairobians are listening to you keenly. Give your closing remark as you are telling them what you want to offer them. Go ahead, Dr. Miguna. So first of all, I want to say to all Kenyans, not just Nairobians, but all Kenyans, but particularly those who live in Nairobi, power, you say belongs, power belongs to the people. Power is in your hands. Your vote is your power. Nobody owns you. Nobody owns your vote. Nobody owns your life and your, um, your right to decide uh, who will govern you. This is an opportunity to take back the power that was averted in 2017. This is the time to demonstrate to the power barons in Nairobi that you will not be their slaves, you will not be their uh, uh, servants, you will not be uh, um, controlled, manipulated, or made to vote for things that do not represent what are in your best interest. I am going to offer you vibrant, focused, visionary, transformative leadership. A leadership that is honest, that has integrity. A leadership that addresses the needs of the people. Not a leadership that answers to state house, that answers to power barons like Raila Odinga. So that's what I offer. I am independent minded, I am focused on the needs of the people, and I would like to transform the lives of all Nairobians, regardless of race, regardless of tribe, regardless of political affiliation. Thank you. Very much, Dr. Miguna. And for viewers, don't forget to follow KDR TV for more information, I mean, for more news, for more interviews. So when you subscribe, when you follow us, you get live feeds so that you can actually know the next interview is going to be uh, discussing about what. So, Dr. Miguna, thank you very much. Let's meet next time. Bye. Thank you. And have a good day. Thank you very much.